Uh, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Now, this is the last but one day of our Rimini meeting, of this 30th uh, Rimini meeting. It will long be remembered for the richness of the contributions and the many interesting events during this meeting. We were able to celebrate at our best this important uh, celebration of our 30th anniversary. Now, this morning meeting is another uh, very significant one. Thanks to our distinguished guests that are here with us this morning and testifying to the fact that the meeting is open to the world. Let me introduce them starting from my right. Somebody that you have certainly heard a lot about, especially in the UK, for his influence on the conservative leaders in the country. And uh, we have read a lot in the media about him, and we had already invited him last year, philosopher Philip Blond. Welcome. Non ha, non ha bisogno di... Then, the other guest to my right doesn't need any introduction, the Vice President of the Italian Chamber of Deputies, Mr. Lupi. And you all know him. Now, Mr. Lupi is very often with us. Mr. Blond is here for the second time. On the contrary, it is for us a great honor and privilege to welcome here one of the most important politicians in the U.S. who is with us for the first time at the center of the American political life of the last few years, a great leader, leadership that he learned at the leadership of one of the most complex states of the United States, Florida. So welcome the former governor of Florida, Mr. Jeb Bush. Now, how did we come to the idea of this debate? We wanted to observe the American situation and the European. Obviously, the recent credit crunch, the recession which exploded, especially last year, involved as a response, as a reply, a very strong intervention on the part of the American government at all levels. The Obama administration took an even stronger turn deciding to intervene strongly in the economy, increasing the control on the banking activities, and also intervening in the automobile sectors. You probably are all aware of, the, of what happened at Chrysler and Fiat. And they are now working to fulfill a very costly and ambitious healthcare reform. And as you probably know, this is the center of a very fierce uh, public debate in the country, in the United States, and the Americans are divided on this, of course. So there's a stronger role of the federal government, which has a lot to do not only with economy, but also with culture, scientific research, and education. At the same time, in Europe, we are witnessing during this year a growing interest, a growing weight of choices that are made in Brussels and Strasbourg. Sometimes we don't realize it, but our our lives are more and more regulated and suffer from what is decided in Brussels, so away from the internal debates. Out of 100 laws that are published in the Italian official journal, at least 78 are implementation that are actually imposed on us from Brussels. Obviously, the European is an Union is an integrated union, and very often they regulate important matters, including matters that have to do with life, family, new rights, a lot of bureaucracy that, is, uh, that comes from Brussels. So that's why we decided it would be interesting to learn more about the two situations, the European and the American, and maybe to have some new insights that for, the, for the future. So let's start from either side of the, on the, of the Atlantic, and then we will move on to Mr. Lupi. Let's start from the UK, London, the government led by Gordon Brown. Philip Blond is at the center of his own think tank, Res Publica, and his ideas are very often taken as are very, are very often to the help of the conservative government. Please, Mr. Blond. 
Um, thank you very much. It's a genuine pleasure and a real honour to once more address the meeting at Rimini. The, cr the crisis that hit us sort of uh, in the last 18 months is for me um, an origin of certain prior moves. And they are very simply the centralization of the economy and the centralization of the state. And these two phenomena, the centralized state and the centralized economy, happened in Britain by the politics of the left and the politics of the right. In effect, what's been lacking in my country is a radical understanding of political and economic subsidiarity. So what I would like to briefly do is give you an account of how the left, through the centralized state, has, has produced a democracy that's only for the elite. and how the right, through an insufficient understanding of market economics, has produced a centralized economy. And those two forces coincided to allow and permit levels of debt and speculation that have effectively broken the Anglo-Saxon model and called forth the possibility of an entirely new political and economic settlement within which subsidiarity will and must play a key role. So I will talk about Britain, but hopefully it will have clear relevance um, beyond uh, my country. It is now clear that, that we are at one of those epoch-changing moments in British political history. Just as the shift in 1979 from the Labour Party with the election of Mrs Thatcher marked a paradigm shift, an utter and complete reversal of the pre-existing order, and the arrival of something new, something revolutionary, and something transformative. So the present unde unprecedented debt crisis of 2008-2009 is doing the same. 1979, with the end election of Mrs. Thatcher, brought an end to the welfare state. The crisis of 2008-2009 will see an end to the market state. And the next election will, we hope, <laughs> usher in the birth of what I will call the civic state. We know what was right and what was wrong with the welfare state. It is right to provide a floor through which people cannot fall. It is right to have a safety net which catches and supports people who for reasons of health, wealth or market fluctuation cannot sustain themselves in the interim. Finally, it is right to secure the general well-being of all through a universal account of the common good and the necessity of full participation in it. However, we also know that welfare is a far more effective ceiling than it is an adequate floor. It traps as many as it helps, 
and condemns, therefore, a whole class, often at the bottom of society, to permanent poverty and dependence. Furthermore, welfare disempowers its recipients. The philosophy of entitlement destroys consciousness of mutuality and it fragments the culture of the poor, the, co the practices of the working class, and permanently disables the associative drive that alone can make communities and foster the development of wealth, independence, and self-sufficiency. Finally, welfareism was the Faustian bargain that the left struck with what I call monopoly capitalism. That is a mode of capitalism, a mode of economics that only works for the already rich and the already asset endowed. This type of welfareism ensures a kind of permanent ascendancy of the middle over the working class and creates an antagonistic feudal structure where any extension of power and ownership to the poor is resisted by the liberal, liberal middle classes who, by the way, often benefit most from welfare but who fear for their own social status and their own right to social mobility. Similarly, we know what is right and what is wrong with the market state. Clearly, the market is a more effective and efficient mechanism for the distribution of many resources than the state. Evidently, if one can enter the marketplace and if one has something to trade, the market creates wealth, prosperity and independence. Finally, there is the manifest good of liberty. And unless this has an economic reality, one would exist under the permanent subjugation of the state or the private cartel. Yet we now know, at least in the Anglo-Saxon world, what is wrong with the market state. Too often in Britain or America, the critique of public state monopoly replaced a public monopoly with a private cartel. The example in America is with the breakup of AT&T. The same thing in Britain is with the breakup of British Telecom. Often what happened is state monopolies were transferred to private monopolies with no real benefit for individuals, citizens or the consumers. In the Anglo-Saxon world, in the name of breaking up the state, too little attempt was applied to breaking up the market. Under the dispensation of the market state, private replaced public monopoly, and market entry was therefore effectively and progressively denied to newcomers. The majority of Britons, having been denied entry to the market, lost any access to investment capital. Thus, the ability to transform one's life or situation declined as wealth flowed upwards rather than downwards. And a new oligarchical class, asset rich and keen on debt leverage, assumed market freedom was synonymous with their complete ascendancy in the economy. Market fundamentalism of the type practiced in Britain and America abandoned the fundamentals of markets. Chancellors promised no more boom and bust. The state sanctioned monopoly capitalism and sat happily on the tax receipts of unrestrained global gambling. In Britain, Labour stoked the engine of inequality. It abandoned the rest of the economy for the receipts of city or financial speculation. And it used the goods from that financial speculation 
for welfareism. Thus, the market state of the right and the welfare state of the left merged into one. And they both colluded in a system whose bankruptcy is now ongoing and self-evident. The welfare state and the market state are now two defunct and mutually supporting failures. The, the real merit of the current conservative renaissance in Britain has escaped notice. Those on the bankrupt left in Britain argue that this new conservatism is just a version of the old Thatcherism. And many of those on the bankrupt right secretly hope this is the case. And both the left and the right seem to want nothing more than a return to the old status quo, where the economy functioned for the benefit of the few, and the tax receipts from that funded the welfare benefits for the many. Modern progressive conservatism rejects both dispensations. It seeks to replace the market state and the welfare state with the civic state. The civic state aims to blend the benefits of welfare and the market mechanism, not by favoring one or the other, but by exceeding both. The conservatives' new civic settlement privileges the associative above the alienated, the responsible over the self-serving, and it recognises that community and individual occur together and both must be supported at the same time. As such, David Cameron's political agenda is far more radical, far-reaching and transformative than many recognisers. It offers a way out of the failed class-based politics of the past. It would offer, through expanded notions of ownership, a way to escape the conflicts between capital and labour. It would inveigh with equal vigour against the public monopolies of the state and the private cartels of the market. In order to break down the barriers to market participation, and individual capitalization. Finally, it could undo the ruinous consequences of state-sanctioned multiculturalism and the lazy moral and social relativism of the liberal middle class. What conservatism is now trying to do in Britain is bring about a new compact of mutual responsibility and a binding social ethic. As such, a new modern conservatism could be the foundation of a new commonwealth, a recognition that you cannot have individual morality on its own, nor can you have collective morality on its own. But the truth is, of the new settlement, that of individuals in relationship. So in the face of the current collapse of credit-engendered and state-sanctioned monopoly capitalism, and arise once more of a state centralization to bail out a failed monopoly enterprise, that is investment banking as it's been practiced, the most urgent need is to craft an entirely new political economy in Britain and a refigured paradigm for markets and trade. This new progressive conservative economics will pursue three goals, the remoralization of the market, the relocalization of the economy, and the recapitalization of the poor. Only markets located in and shaped by a moral architecture are sustainable, as Adam Smith understood. Without law, morality, custom, and conscience, 
We would have anarchy in place of exchange and extortion in place of contract. Economic outputs needs to pass a series of social tests and true conservatives need to tie economic policy to the social outcomes they favour. For true conservatives, it must be the extension of wealth, assets and the benefits of ecological and social well-being to all. Freedom from the monopoly dominance of state bureaucracy and market power would allow independence for the formation of community and autonomy and a rebalancing of the demands of work, family and childcare. Secondly, more attention needs to be paid to the health of local economies. In Britain, Labour's market state, subservient to big business, has generated a nation of clone towns or ghost towns where retail outlets are either identical or absent. Blur and Brown's worship of monopoly markets has produced the contemporary Anglo-Saxon paradox of competition without competitors an exclusive favouring of the big box retail model and the permanent dominance of supermarkets. Small businesses are squeezed out by the monopolistic power of transnational enterprises and the barriers to market entry that their economies of scale, often underwritten by public tax receipts, represent. Small wonder that the UK has one of the lowest percentages of small and medium businesses in the OECD. But small and medium businesses are how, ordinary, how millions of ordinary people own and secure the wealth for themselves and their families. The present market system in the Anglo-Saxon world dispossesses them and recategorizes them as permanent members of a low-wage shop-serving rather than shop-owning class. By toughening planning laws and reforming tax bases, conservatives can restore local economies and local capital so that the benefits of trade flow downwards to all participants rather than upwards to the tax-avoiding offshore aristocracy that has been ascendant. Finally, the third goal of modern radical conservatism is the recapitalization of the poor. In Britain, under the reign of the monopoly market, the poor have been wholly dispossessed. In 1976, the bottom 50% of the British population owned 12% of the nation's liquid wealth. By 2003, they had just 1%. These trends are similar, I think, in the US as well. In Britain, savings rates have declined to, the lowest, to levels last seen in the 1940s. Wages at the bottom have risen slowest. And the poverty gap, both relative and absolute, has widened. While we have been lectured on the universal benefits of the now failed model of global capitalism. A new radical agenda of ownership extension and security and economic security is therefore urgently required. If the most vulnerable victims of the debt finance depression are to be saved from re-proletarianization and permanent subjection to an inadequate welfare state, a new popular philosophy of asset extension and stakeholder equity capitalism is required. To conclude, in Britain, and also I believe in America, what is needed is a market that delivers on its promises and delivers prosperity, wealth and security for all. In order to deliver that, we need, in the Anglo-Saxon world, to take the principle of subsidiarity seriously across our entire political, social and economic spectrum. You already have economic subsidiarity. 
In Britain, this has been taken away from us. So the key task for a radical conservatism is, is to ally the political subsidiarity of real democracy, real localism, with a new economic and political program of economic subsidiarity. Only then can we have an empowered citizenry that won't need the centralized state to underpin it. Thank you very much. Ringrazio Philip Blond per una presentazione ricchissima. Thank you very much. Philip Blond for a very enriching uh, presentation, providing us with a lot of food for thought. Certainly the decline of the welfare state and the new emergence of a civic uh, state is a very interesting topic, both for us in Italy and in the United States. And also all the suggestions concerning subsidiarity principle, which would be very helpful for the continuation of our debate. And now we can cross the Atlantic and go on the others and go to the United States. As we said, governor of Florida for eight years, to 1999 to 2007, and at the end of his office, because he had to go because you cannot have more, have more than two terms of terms. Um, and he left with a very, very high uh, success rates, highly appreciated. Now, I very often go to the United States and Florida, the Florida governed by Jeb Bush has always been uh, indicated to me as a wonderful place to go to for holidays, but also as a place which has been marvelously managed uh, in, in political terms. Obviously, the former governor has done a great job and he has now started a foundation which is concentrating on um, the topic of education. But Jeb Bush also remains one of the most outstanding representatives of the Republican Party. He's also at the federal level. He belongs to an important uh, political dynasty which gave America already two presidents, the father and uh, the brother, and in Italy we always say, well, if there's a two, there's always a three, that's an Italian saying. <laughs> and he's uh, certainly at the center of the new debate for the future, we now during the uh, political party, which now during the Obama administration will be at the opposition. So I now would like to give him the floor and also I would like to give the the, to, go, to welcome the uh, Lady Bush, Mrs. Colomba Bush. Welcome. Good morning. I would like to thank the organizers of the Ramini meeting for inviting me here. Mr. Bardassi, Mr. Lupi, Mr. Blan, it's an honor to be with you on this panel. Over the past, past few days, my wife, Columba, and I have enjoyed hearing so many interesting views about topics of great importance, not only for Catholics, but for all men and women of goodwill. It's truly been a great experience. My assignment today is to comment on Il futuro degli stati, federalismo o decentramento. That's all the Italian I know. This, of course, from the perspective of the United States. This has been a topic of debate throughout the Western world for the last 50 years. President Obama's breathtaking plan to dramatically expand the reach of the United States government in nearly every area of life has breathed new energy and enthusiasm into the conversation. As we speak here in Rimini, heated discussions are occurring in our country, in the United States, 
around the kitchen tables, at the office, and now in town hall meetings. While I often wish that the discourse was more civil and a little more substantive, I am heartened that there is a lively, in fact, in fact, a very, very lively debate going on in our country about the proper role of government in a free and just society. Americans know the stakes are high. The path we choose will define or, to, or perhaps redefine who we are as a nation. The materials for this panel referred to the current political events in the United States as the most ambitious program expansion, excuse me, of the role of government since probably the age of the great society. In, in fact, proposals today are not only bigger than the great society, but also of the New Deal in terms of the federal government's involvement in day-to-day -day life of Americans. I'll leave it to historian Paul Johnson to pass judgment on the wisdom of imitating that era. He said, if interventionism worked in the New Deal, it took nine years and a world war to demonstrate that fact. Government spending is the leading indicator for the growth of government in our lives. At his inauguration eight months ago, President Obama inherited an economy in deep recession. A huge decline in federal receipts due to the downturn caused a federal deficit of $800 billion. The new administration's response to this significant drop in revenue was simply to spend more. Vice President Joe Biden summed up the approach best. He said, we have to go spend money to keep from going bankrupt. The pent-up demand for more government by liberals made Congress a willing, in fact, an eager partner in the spending spree. In the first hundred days, the President and Congress approved a $787 billion stimulus package to stimulate our ailing economy. Interestingly, less than 15% of this economic rescue package has been spent during these eight months. Then, Congress approved the President's request to grow the current budget by $410 billion, a bump of more than 20 percent in discretionary spending for this fiscal year. Even more troubling is that this new spending becomes the new baseline for future growth of government. These increases in spending do not include the estimated $1.2 trillion for the new health care bill that is working its way through Congress, or the hundreds of billions of dollars in cost for the cap and trade tax bill that is sitting in the United States Senate. It should not be all surprising that President Obama's proposed budget for next year increases spending by another 10 percent. As a result of all this spending, federal spending equals 28 percent of gross domestic product, more than any point since World War II, and all government spending combined, federal, state, and local consumes 40 percent of the economic activity in our country. The debate that we're having in the United States and here as well might be a little different if we actually had the money. But in fact, we don't have the cash. 
Today, the budget deficit is $1.8 trillion. And President Obama's administration expects the federal debt to grow to over $9 trillion in the next 10 years. And that is a rosy projection because it requires economic growth of 3% per year for the next nine years. Otherwise, the deficit will grow larger, which is the more likely scenario. The dramatic expansion of the federal government doesn't stop with more spending and more borrowing. A new form of government involvement has emerged in the last year. That is the government's unprecedented intervention in private enterprise and the astonishing speed in which this occurred. In less than a year, government became the financer, the owner, the regulator, and the taxer of both the financial services sector as well as the auto industry. In my opinion, this is a toxic concoction that will create conflicts with far-reaching implications beyond just these two sectors of our economy. Even without a recession and new spending, the cost of government will grow exponentially in the coming years. The retiring baby boomer generation is creating gigantic deficits in Medicare and Social Security. Our retirement and health insurance programs for the elderly. And the fiscal impacts of government guarantees for quasi-government entities like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loom over the horizon. So without a return to limited government and without reform, the cost of these programs combined with the projected debt will sadly exceed our ability to pay without eliminating funding for our national defense, for the environment, for education, and for other social services. So given the, long, the reality of the long-term structural entitlement program problem, creating an ever-extending uh, government, and an activist president in Congress that wants to accelerate that reality, is there an alternative? I, I believe there is. It starts with the bedrock belief that there is an inverse relationship between the size and scope of government and human liberty. The bigger government is, the less freedom individuals have to pursue their dreams. And the pursuit of those dreams is an integral part of our progress. Secondly, I believe the alternative is emboldened in the reality that liberty and freedom produce more creativity, more innovation, and more prosperity for more people than any government program ever created. Most, if not all, great advances in life occur by the creative genius of individuals unencumbered by the shackles of the state. While history has proven this point over and over, advocates of the advancement of government appear determined to ignore it. Thirdly, an alternative approach recognizes that the family is the most important political organization ever created. Loving, loving parents whose organizing principle is the love and betterment of their children at their own material expense is a powerful force for social progress. In fact, in fact, if wholesome family life were the norm, 
in the United States, a significant amount of the demands placed on government would evaporate, not to mention the need for this debate. Finally, wherever possible, government should empower individuals, families, and faith and community-based organizations rather than crowd them out with mind-numbing rules, regulations, and command and control policies. If this, if this alternative strategy sounds familiar, it should, since it's taken from the principles of subsidiarity. While subsidiarity is an integral part of Catholic social teaching, the philosophy of handling matters at the least centralized authority was a foundational principle of the creation of the United States of America. From the 10th Amendment of our Constitution, which prohibits the federal government from doing what be, can be done at the state or local government level, to the even more foundational principle that freedom from government can only exist among a truly self-governing people, our past greatness derives from an abi abiding by the principles of subsidiarity. With the time I have remaining, I would like to share three stories from my experience of becoming and being governor of the state of Florida. They were about three very different groups of people facing very different challenges, abused children, prisoners soon to be released back to society, and students in our public education system. Yet all three of these groups saw their lives improve by policies rooted in subsidiarity. As a candidate for governor in 1998, I wandered around the state, listening and learning from the people I wanted to serve and lead. Ironically, one of the most important places I explored didn't technically have any voters at all. It was the, chi it was the child welfare system and it was ugly. At any given time, 30,000 to 50,000 Florida children are wards of the state in some fashion because they've been abused, neglected, or abandoned. I went to dependency courts and foster care homes. I visited compassionate care workers, caseworkers, overwhelmed by the bureaucracy that had no accountability. I met with caring community groups that wanted to help but were shut out by government. Yeah, sure. Hello? Yes? After seeing firsthand the heartbreaking impact of the state controlled. No. Problema technical. Just a second. Obama, Obama. Says Obama. <laughs> L'intervento di Obama. Dal mio microfono si sente? Posso farlo sedere al mio posto? Mi sentite dal mio microfono?
fatemi un cenno sulla possibile soluzione, altrimenti la traduco io. Ditemi voi. Possiamo riprovare? I'll translate you. I, pro I propose an alternative, a community-based care system. Ho proposto un'alternativa, un sistema di assistenza uh, gestito dalla comunità. The theory was that a community would be would care more about kids in their own backyard. L'idea era che una comunità può uh, aver più a cura i bambini uh, che crescono nel, nel loro ambito. And they would organize more effectively to save the lives and end the anguish of these precious children. E loro potevano organizzare meglio in maniera più efficace eh, per poter salvare le vite e la sofferenza di questi bambini preziosi. After a lot of fighting and pitfalls along the way. Dopo molto combattimento e anche una serie di ostacoli di ogni genere lungo la strada, Florida now has the first community-based child care welfare system in the United States and it yields far far better results than the government run system. La Florida adesso ha il primo sistema di assistenza ai bambini basato sulla comunità negli Stati Uniti, il primo sistema di questo genere e dà risultati molto molto migliori di quelli gestiti dallo Stato. Including more adoptions into loving families, better trained foster care parents to take care of the kids that are hurting both physically and emotionally. And fewer kids being abandoned and abused through prevention. E tra questi risultati sono incluse più adozioni in famiglie che li vogliono bene, eh, genitori meglio addestrati, meglio preparati a crescere questi figli, a prendersi cura di loro e, eh, e minori bambini con conseguenze emotive e abbandonate, eh, abbandonati lungo la strada o che vengono abusati. Another example occurred in 1998 when I went to Sugarland, Texas to visit a wing of a large state prison in fact my brother was governor of the state so i could get in and into the prison un altro esempio è successo nel 98 quando ero a Sugarland in Texas a visitare una grande prigione dello stato e in realtà il mio fratello era il governatore del Texas all'epoca quindi potevo tranquillamente entrare nelle prigioni where inmates were volunteered in the last two years of their sentence Into a faith -based program. E qui i detenuti potevano fare i volontari negli ultimi anni della, della loro pena eh, per dedicarsi a programmi basati sulla fede. Despite the normal workload of a regular prisoner, they found time for prayer meetings, church services and contemplative Bible reading. Nonostante il carico di lavoro normale di un detenuto regolare, trovavano tempo per la preghiera, per incontri di preghiera, eh, servizi religiosi e eh, lettura della Bibbia insieme. Volunteers mentored them at the prison and, and guaranteed in fact that they would have a job once they were released. Prego. They will... I will never forget attend I'll never forget attending a church service at five in the morning and hearing a retired firefighter give a fiery sermon about the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure what happened to the other people in the room during that talk, but it inspired me to act on what I learned in Sugarland, Texas. When I was elected governor, we eliminated the cumbersome rules that kept volunteers out of our prisons and provided support for the prison chaplains so they could more better minister to their flock. Several years later, we set up the first totally faith-based prison in the United States. 
These inmates were met with hard work, but also with that same Holy Spirit, ministered through hundreds of volunteers of many faiths. Two years later, we set up the first woman faith-based prison in the United States. Once released, the percentage of reoffending re is significantly lower than the mainstream prison population. The last example touches the lives of nearly everyone. A quality education is a leading indicator of a prosperous life. Yet, in many countries, including the United States, the, ed the education system is centered around adults and protected from change by bureaucracy. The learning is homogenized and standardized even though we know that children learn differently and at different paces. In the United States, we spend more per student on education than any country in the world and are ranked in the middle or more often at the bottom by most international standards. As a candidate for governor, I visited 250 schools in 1998 which only fueled my commitment to advocate meaningful reform. Out of the bureaucratic maze, we brought transparency. Today, schools earn grades just like students, A, B, C, D, and F, totally based on student learning in reading, writing, math, and science. Schools that improved their grades or earned an A were, were rewarded directly with an additional amount of money equal to $100 per student. We also empowered tens of thousands of parents with the financial freedom to send their children to the best public or private option. With more accountability, more power at the school level to achieve results, and more parental choice, Florida students have, ex have exceeded the national average and minority and lower income Florida students have made the greatest gains. In this important policy area, I am hopeful that the Obama administration will do what it doesn't appear to be doing on fiscal policy or health care or energy which is to allow the closest level of governing to rise to the challenge of assuring that our next generation gains the power of knowledge. I am more confident than ever before that there is an emerging coalition in the United States coalescing beyond, behind the belief that government can't spend its way to our prosperity that we cannot continue to indebt ourselves through government today and not negatively impact our children and grandchildren, and that strong families and a robust civil society have been and will be at the core of our success as a nation. How this new coalition emerges in the next few years We'll have much to say about who we are as a nation as we move forward in these exciting and perilous times. Thank you all for allowing me to come today.
Grazie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bosch, and thank you very much for being uh, flexible because of the uh, technical problems. We call technical problems events, and that is also part of our title, and they are part of knowledge. Thank you very much for this uh, brilliant analysis of the hot points in uh, U.S. politics. Thank you very much for uh, talking about uh, a general issue, i.e. Uh, um, the need to uh, uh, come to terms with a promise made by your founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence, uh, leaving citizens free to pursue happiness. I um, appreciate the uh, receipt that uh, was proposed also by Philip Lond. Uh, concerning the uh, issue of uh, subsidiarity. The third guest we have this morning is, I think, the uh, most important expert on subsidiarity. Mr. Lupi has been uh, supporting uh, the role of subsidiarity. Uh, he founded a bipartisan uh, group uh, called Intergruppo, Intergroup, uh, for subsidiarity. So uh, the floor to the uh, Deputy Chairman of the Italian Parliament, Mr. Luke. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Blond and uh, Mr. Bosch for their words. Uh, um, our uh, uh, chairman is right uh, today is Friday. Uh, this is the last but one day of the 30th uh, meeting of Rimini. I think that this is uh, the first time in our history uh, we had the opportunity to deal with important issues through the words of uh, testimonies. Uh, people are coming here uh, to bear witness of the fact that the freedom and the wealth, the well-being of a person um, is uh, uh, jeopardized uh, by uh, reality. But when uh, that happens, uh, uh, reality is uh, a source of uh, growth. Uh, I'm very much impressed uh, uh, by a word uh, which we uh, have very dear to our hearts, uh, something which uh, in the past was part of the social doctrine of the church and was not even mentioned by the Italian constitution for the term subsidiarity in the Italian constitution uh, was included only after the constitutional reform of 2001. So that's a, a challenge for our intellects. It's a great practical opportunity offered to politicians, governments and institutions to reconstruct our societies on much more solid pillars. Allow me to respond to uh, three issues uh, which uh, uh, were raised by the title of the meeting and the words of the two previous speakers. A key element to tackle the uh, title of this session uh, what are the possible uh, roads uh, uh, for states and nations. As Mr. Blond said, uh, the the uh, roots uh, of the crisis or the, the, the crisis is always a great opportunity for us as governors and uh, those people who are in charge of a country. The key question uh, to be posed uh, to answer this question is the one raised by Mr. Bush. So what is the role of government uh, in uh, a just society? Uh, uh, so, uh, we must answer uh, this uh, fundamental question, in particular those who have uh, political and institutional uh, responsibilities, otherwise there cannot be a, a clear response. Uh, it will always provide distorted answers. We won't be able to understand each other. So what is the role of uh, the government in a just society? I think that the answer is uh, a word mentioned by the two previous uh, speakers 
uh, before, which comes before the term subsidiarity. The term is freedom, liberty. Mr. Bosch uh, said, uh, what can be the alternative to uh, Mr. Obama's uh, program? We have been defeated uh, by uh, Mr. Uh, Obama in the uh, past elections. And uh, I think uh, one has to reconstruct the, the identity of the Republican Party, uh, which has been defeated in the past elections. The only alternative can be that of uh, rediscovering or understanding that the role in a, of a government in a just society is that to be uh, at the service of persons and guarantee their freedom of action. However, why do you think that uh, federalism and devolution are a, a dichotomy? If we analyze the uh, roots of these two terms, uh, we see that the, they are two completely uh, different things. Federalism, in uh, the origin of the word, uh, it contains a, a, an ideal. Uh, federalism is a Pact, fedus. It's a pact, a covenant implying that different subjects decide to join forces so that, or, or rather because they sign a, a, a covenant because they have something in common. It's a, a community, a community of people joining forces and recognizing themselves in something which they have in common. Decentralization or devolution means transferring power to a different level. So the object of the evolution is power. So the, the discussion of the modern state is exactly that. The birth of a modern state in the concept of enlightenment comes from Hobbes, who stated that as a human being is not positive, human beings contain uh, evil and they uh, cannot join other people because they uh, have limits. There should be a third subject, the Leviathan, uh, to whom we uh, uh, give proxy uh, uh, to control the fact that we join forces. So the state is born from that. We do believe that devolution, or rather power, is something good if put at the service of human beings. For it's a human being in his or herself is good, uh, powerful, and always has the possibility to respond to the reality they are confronted with and assert something positive. This is the main difference. So uh, this is part of uh, philosophy of the right government and there comes the idea of subsidiarity where the person is at the center uh, politics is at the service of the person the service to the common good and uh, freedom as a flag uh, opposite to the idea of a government as a bad power power to assert uh, itself uh, where man is at the service of that power often so uh, my, this mechanism uh, was disrupted, uh, as we heard, uh, and that happened in Italy, not because of intellectual reasons, but because, uh, uh, indeed, reality is uh, very different uh, from the way we intend it. In the past, in Italy, this idea of the power of the state uh, collapsed, and that collapsed because it, it was no longer in line with the needs of the, of the real country. And so inefficiency prevailed uh, uh, over the possibility to give answers. That's why we started again uh, discussing that concept, that idea of the state, of the power of uh, citizens at the service of the state, as uh, this is not able to give uh, uh, good answers to the citizens. It is inefficient, and so it has to be changed. And we are here to talk about the alternative. Sto parlando di, eh, di astrazione. La realtà è concreta, molto concreta, perché i bisogni che noi abbiamo sono concreti, concretissimi. We have concrete ideas. I mean, let's deal with concrete facts. So, all the discussion that is going on in Italy, northern Italy, south, and it, our country is divided. And uh, recently, I mean, a few days ago, the Edison Foundation published something very interesting. It's an interesting finding saying that Italy is full of potential 
But the idea of governance only based on power and decentralization and evolution of powers uh, with the citizens, the citizens at the center, what I think is best, that citizens must have needs. As long as he has needs, he will have to turn to somebody for help, to those who have the power. This is a different idea. We have a different idea. Now, why is subsidiarity our response to inefficiency and to welfareism? Because the idea of subsidiarity itself and everything that is connected to subsidiarity, and just look around and see the the accounts that have been given during the, the, this meeting. It, the, the objective is not so much to provide people with responses, but in provided responses to the people who have needs, you obviously want that the person becomes a better person, becomes a, a person who will have fewer needs because of your action. I think it is like that. I mean, I have an interest in providing a response for meeting the needs of the people, and I really hope that this person will become a better person, that a person will become a creative and, 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 and will become a person who, who is better. In Italy, social conflicts have never been exaggerated because, I mean, and also it has always been easy in Italy to climb uh, the social classes. I mean, you can be born in the, in the working class and climb the social stairs. Because in Italy, religion has always been very strong. That's the reason for this. Now, starting from this, I think the, I mentioned the Edison uh, Foundation, and, and they said that Italy is divided, that there is a strong gap between North and South. We know that North and Italy is much richer than the South. And GDP, the GDP is, much diff is very different North from South. In Northern Italy, if we, and, and they provided us with, with figures. So northern Italy, the, the GDP is exactly the same as Spain. But, well, I mean, a lot has been said on Italy, lagging behind, the delays. We have 4,200 euros more in terms of per capita GDP between Spain and northern and central Italy. We generate more wealth and they create more wealth than UK, 400 euros more. If we take, the, if we take southern Italy, 21 million inhabitants, the per capita G GDP decreases dramatically from 28,000 to 16,000. It's more than 10,000 euros uh, less. Similar findings are to be found in Portugal. In, Port in Portugal, they have 1,600 more in terms of per capita GDP, more than southern Italy. Now, why is southern Italy lagging behind? Why the figures are so low? There's a problem with infrastructure, but there's certainly a problem with accountability, responsibility, and the problem of culture, a problem of, the, of politics and the politicians that are, have always insisted on welfareism, of, on creating uh, inefficiency instead of putting the person back at the center. D'altra parte, e vado a... And now I have, quick, I have to conclude quickly. The role of government in building a juster society whose only objective is the management of power, and I can guarantee this in the light of my experience, the power can only praise inefficiency. I mean, only, I mean, the more you're inefficient, the less you are protagonist, and the more you need my role, the more you need the government. This is a vicious circle that we, we need to stop. There's another interesting finding that we can make a reflection upon, and that, and that also triggered the need for reform in our country. Now, nothing to do with northern Italy, nothing to do with the region of Lombardy, the richest uh, region in northern Italy also because I work with the governor of Lombardy, Mr. Formigoni. Let's take a kindergarten. In Rome, it costs 16,000 euros per capita. In Modena, northern Italy, 7,000. What is the reason behind this? If uh, a bag of blood in southern Italy is four times more expensive than in northern Italy, what is the reason behind this? Is it just infrastructure? Or maybe behind this huge difference, there is the idea of accountability, responsibility, of inefficiency, which is deeply rooted in the culture and in the politics of southern Italy. There is a lot to do on education, and we have to challenge this. 
If we go to the Napoli stand here at the Rimini meeting, you'll see that, that we can achieve great results, that a lot can be done to improve education and to, imp and, and to generate wealth. Now, I have mentioned these two examples, and here I move quite quickly to the second problem. Also because if the objective of the government is to guarantee in a just society, is to guarantee uh, the person and meet their needs and increase their liberty and freedom, then the way of governing, how you govern, is actually a tool, an instrument. It must be the best instrument to meet the concrete needs, current needs, not past needs. And I don't want to say that the, the state that we've had in Italy in the post-war years, which allowed us to be the fifth or sixth world power in, in, in Italy, maybe it was very helpful in the post-war years, but now we have something new ahead of us, and we have to come up with new tools, new instruments to govern this country. In order order to, to meet the needs of the citizens in a more efficient way. Now that we know a lot about subsidiarity and, and these other things, that's why federalism as a challenge implies the use of a new instrument for subsidiarity because we have to work in the community. We have to work from a new reality. We have to increase accountability of each and every one of us. We have to promote solidarity. We have to get people together and making them feel belonging to the community. All the community is striving to achieve the common goal, which is the unity of the country. This is not something theoretical. It's something very concrete. Then we could compare compare the federal state in Italy with the European Union and also with the United States of America. You might think, think about it, you might think that what is going on in Europe is building a stronger European Union. And we think that the process of integration, is it, is, has it anything to do with federalism? Is it a federal agreement? I mean, what, what do we have in common? What is, what is the common thread among all these nations that are building this powerful Europe? Why are they getting together? Why are they uniting? All the debate on the roots, the, the Judaism, the Christian roots of uh, the European Union. Think of that debate, because the very idea of getting together also at the institutional level is n not firstly based on a federal pact. It's not because you have something in common, but un un unfortunately, it's based on bureaucracy and economy. Let's build a bigger market so that we can all have advantages. But then there is not enough room for all the single people. And then the nations start protesting, because maybe it's like seeing a new uh, Prince, which has nothing to do with me. It's like uh, the bureaucrats in Europe. I mean, I don't want to have, I mean, I have princes in my own nation. Why should I respect the princes of, of, of Brussels, probably limiting my liberty? That's the biggest challenge that we have ahead of us. And let me conclude by saying that I think the greatest challenge that we have ahead of us, I talked a lot with Calderoli and Formigoni here at the Rimini meeting, we have to go beyond the, um, the, the idea of standard expenditure. I mean, historical expenditure has a lot to do with ser bad services very often and inefficiency. We all have to pay for things that have always existed, and we have to continue paying. On the contrary, this standard cost will pay for the service, but implies a strong accountability based on solidarity and unity. This goes without saying. Solidarity is always in order. And let me conclude by saying, can subsidiarity be the new pillar on which to build Italy and the institutional forms, can they work around the principle of subsidiarity as the, something new to, for our citizens? I think the answer is absolutely yes, provided that the institutional model that we are purport, purporting, and I am thinking here about federalism, which is not simply to be seen as an institutional idea and as something abstract, something theoretical, 
where you have a central state, regions, provinces, and municipalities. It must be the instrument which in this new organization can guarantee a stronger horizontal subsidiarity. That is, citizens become protagonists. Their association, SMEs, the community, the voluntary sectors, to guarantee the freedom on each and every one of us. If federalism will be this in Italy, then it will be a success. Otherwise, it will be a failure. Otherwise, we are better served with the present government in Rome, centralized government. I mean, federalism is, is a very good idea, but it must be the right form. And then federalism or devolution, are they an alternative? Well, if we want to enact federalism, we also need to devolute powers to the peripheral, to the lowest level, the closest levels. Otherwise, we will always promote and foster inefficiencies. And we have to guarantee that those powers who were formerly at the central level, at the government in Rome, and which have always produced a lot of inefficiency, might have an impact on the new state. It can only function, provided that solidarity is not an abstract word, but is connected to the term subsidiarity. If we all, if citizens are at the center of any activities, the entrepreneurs, the father, the parents, the governors, the politician, if each and every one of us in what do we do in our daily life, if we are aware that we are all protagonists and that we are contributing to build a stronger nation, that we are contributing to the common good for our society, because we are here in the world and we are here to give something to, con to, to make it a better world, then it will be a success. And democracy is based exactly on this. I mean, we hear a lot about democracy, but sometimes we forget what it means. Democracy implies this very concept fundamental, the fact that the other is always enriching for you. It's a precious resource for you. There are, there are individuals, but then there are the other individuals. And there's a lot of at stake here in Italy. Let's look at other examples, at other experiences, at other accounts, things that happen elsewhere. And we can learn a lot to see whether we can, we can win this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Lupi, uh, for uh, this very uh, detailed uh, analysis of the uh, challenge uh, which has already been described by the previous speakers, uh, uh, our time is over, but I have to ask a, a, a final question to Mr. Bosch, who is the person coming from the uh, most distant place. So my question is this. Yesterday, uh, you uh, indeed attended the presentation by the former Prime Minister uh, Tony Blair. Uh, I saw that you met yesterday at the Grand Hotel and discovered that you are very good friends. Uh, Mr. Blair spoke uh, the role of, uh, of faith in his activity as a politician. He uh, has been converted to a Roman Catholic Church. You are a Roman Catholic. I, I, I think you are the only one in your family. So what is the role uh, for you in your political uh, life, life uh, in the light of what you said before? Uh, what is the role of Roman Catholicism? What is the role of your faith uh, uh, and the faith in general? Anch'io mi sono convertito al cattolicesimo e sono un cattolico episcopale, frequento la messa e il sacerdote mi disse lei deve diventare un cattolico al 100%. E ho adottato I love the the sacraments of the Catholic Church, the timeless nature of the message of the Catholic Church, the fact that the Catholic Church believes in and acts on absolute truth as its foundational principle and doesn't move with the tides of modern, modern times as my former religion did.
So as it relates to making decisions as a public leader, one's faith should guide you. That's not to say that every decision I made would be uh, completely in the um, teachings of the Catholic Church, but it was a guidepost that kept me out of trouble. In the United States, many people think you need to keep your faith, put it in a security box if you're an elected official, put it in a safety deposit box until you finish your service as a public servant, and then you can go get it back. I, I never felt that was appropriate. And so with... With some instances of uh, controversy during my eight years of governor, I tried to act on my faith as best as I could. Grazie. Grazie. Io ringrazio Philip Blond. Grazie all'onorevole Maurizio Lupi. Thank you very much, Mr. Blond, Mr. Lupi, and Governor Bush on behalf of the meeting for this very interesting discussion, which is a further step in the very important journey. And thank you very much to you all.